Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome back to Hamza in the House, the American Muslim podcast where we give a voice to the American Muslims and Muslims throughout the West. We are going to continue uh, this fantastic book, 44 Ways to Manhood by Taymullah Abdurrahman. And uh, I've got Ijaz back in the studio. We're, we're going to finish this first part up, at least the essentials. Um, we ran really long yesterday because there's just so much to talk about. But alhamdulillah, we're going to continue, kind of go through the essentials. Um, so far, you know, we talked about things like halal provisions and um, we kind of skipped over the things that we thought were kind of basic, you know, beliefs in monotheism and sincerity towards Allah. Um, but we got to in, we introduced the author um, and then we got to number four of the first 11 uh, essentials. So we're going to try to hit up the rest of the essentials at least today so we can can finish that part out and then we'll move to the 33 things that he refers to as 33 suggestions. So to begin with, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sabah khair ijaz. Welcome to the um, podcast. Good to see you again. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sabah noor. I hope you're doing well. I'm glad to be back, man. Yeah, it's good. So we were talking the last time about um, when we talk about worship, you know, having discipline. So, you know, we were up at Fajr time watching the sunrise. And now we're in the studio early morning. I, you know, getting started early is like, it really is a blessing. You never really understand the concept of time until you get up early and see how much can be accomplished before other people actually even wake up. Oh yeah, I mean, everyone knows the saying, the early bird gets the worm. Uh, and also we feel it. If you wake up early, you get your work done between the time of Fajr and Dhuhr, you know there's more barakah in that time. For sure, for sure. All right, so um, we stopped with halal provisions. We were talking about basically working and earning a halal living. Number five, uh, he puts uh, a pious wife, but we're actually going to skip that part because we're going to have a, an entire podcast dedicated to marriage, and then we'll we'll actually refer back to him some of the things. He's got really good points, but um, that topic in and of itself is... It, it, it's, it wouldn't do it any justice for us to talk 10 or 15 minutes about it. So we're going to save that for later. And also, I think the next topic, yeah, obedient children, also going to save it for later because uh, parenting is going to be an entire new topic as well. So number seven, a comfortable home. So he says, why is it important? The home is a place where a man retreats from worldly pressures to find comfort and tranquility, it is only behind the walls of his home that a man is truly a king. So yeah, I mean, um, if you go home and you're just as stressed out as if you were at work, then what's really, there's no refuge in your home. And you, you will find this where men don't want to go home. That's why they kind of prolong it. It's like they go to work and then they, they're like, oh, I'm going to go to the cafe with my friends and hang out for a while. And then you're like, hey, isn't it time for you to go home? He's like, yeah, you know, trying to push it as long because he knows that there's there's either there's no tranquility or there's chaos at the house. And that's really not the point of a home, right? The home is a place where I go and I don't have to deal with the nonsense, you know? And uh, yeah, and sometimes, you know, men got to make sure that uh, they take care of their home and that actually I think it's very good to have a space for yourself at home. Um, you know, people always talk about the man cave. Personally, uh, you know, I call mine the library and uh, that's what men need, man. You need that space where you can go, you can sit down, you can, uh, be, you know, be clear headed. You're reading a book, you're uh, doing your work. Um, your assignments, whatever you have to do, but there should be a place for you that you can at least like decompress. Yeah. You can at least decompress and, uh, and not to say that, you know, you just completely avoid being with your family. No, it's just that area is there that instead of finding that isol isolated place outside, you know, you have that isolated place within your household so that you can go there, do your work and then go back to your family. But of course, it's, it shouldn't be a man cave where you just you're there all the time and you never see your 
children, you never interact with your wife. So it can be a problem too. Yeah, the author continues, he goes on, he says, The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, loved spaciousness in the house, and he considered to be a part of a man's contentment in this life. He said, happiness has four elements. Among them are a good wife and a spacious home. And this is a, a sound hadith recorded by Ibn Hibab. So, um, yeah, you know what, it you don't really understand how vital space is until you don't have it. Um, being uh, cramped into a, a very small space is, is horrible. Um, and a lot of arguments, I think, come out of being too close to people, like not having a place to, to kind of get away. So you're always bumping into each other. You're always trying to find your own personal space. And if you're liking that, especially if you have children, especially if there's children, because they need to move. So having them kind of cramped in together um, is is just a source of conflict. And um, women especially, you know, if they're a kitchen, right? A spacious kitchen is like a blessing, right? If you've ever worked in a tiny kitchen, you know just how awful it really, really is. Like there's no room to move around. And if there's two people in there, especially, it's really horrific. Um, it's just, it, it's not a good idea. Yeah. Three things women need are a spacious kitchen, a nice bathroom and huge closet space. Um, and I'm, I'm speak I'm saying this out of experience because, you know, those are the things that my wife asks me for. Yeah. You know, she wants the, uh, she, she says like, first, the first thing, anytime we look at a house, the first thing she wants is the kitchen has to be at least spacious enough. And that's the first thing I got to look at. Uh, you know, and she always looks at closet space and she always looks at, uh, to make sure it's a nice, clean bathroom. Happy wife, happy life. A hundred percent. Yeah. And those things, uh, you know, end up making us happy. Yeah, for, yeah. Oh, definitely. Uh, her happiness in the kitchen relates to happiness at the table, which relates to happiness for everybody. I mean, and and you know, when it comes to you know, even for when it, even for us, you know, the kitchen is something important too because you know we can I can throw down a little bit in the kitchen. Oh, I can. Don't get me started. I put me in there as long as it, as long as I'm alone. I can't do it if someone else is there. All right, they're in my way. I need a, my workspace, right? So even when it comes to workspaces, like if you were in a uh, a wood shop, or like if you had a shop and you were doing woodwork or metal work or something, you don't want to be all cramped in there either. You need space to move around and you're taking materials and moving around. So it's just, it's an, just an essential concept that space is kind of like uh, the freedom that you need, the freedom to move around because that's how you operate in the world. So if you're free to move around outside, and then you come home and then you're like cramped into this cell, you know, and people are annoying you because they're so close to you and everything they do is obnoxious, then it's going to cause, you know, some problems. So that's why it's considered to be like, this is a blessing. Yeah, for sure. All right. See, so he continues, and this is a really great point. He says, uh, to those who claim that Muslims should be poor and live in squalor. We say, have you not heard about the likes of Uthman ibn Affan, Abdurrahman ibn Auf, Imam Abu Hanifa, Abdullah ibn Mubarak, and Imam Malik? These men were among the best of humankind, yet they were rich and lived comfortably within their means. A Muslim does not have to starve and live in a rundown shack in order to prove his piety. Wow. That's a, that's 100% true. Uh, you don't have to be living in a shack to prove your piety. Um, I believe that's a false piety because now you're almost showing off like, look at me, I'm so pious because I don't have anything. When uh, it is a responsibility to make sure that your family is taken care of. We're not talking about buying like a 52 bedroom mansion, or, you know, but they're talking about making sure you have what you need. Yeah. And having wealth is not a sign of anything. I mean, if anything, it's 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 a test. What are you going to do with that wealth? So, um, yeah, a lot of people, some people are just miserly. They're just cheap. 
and then you know it makes it difficult on their families so the wife you know she wants to cook dinner but he's only going to buy chicken that's got bones in it and she's like well can't we have chicken breast and wants to be like no we're not wasting money on this and like, come on bro just give give something like you've got money you're not poor so stop living like you're poor and even the way that you dress um you know there is hadith about um like not walking around with clothes and holes in them if you've if you've been blessed by Allah with wealth then look like it you know don't look like you're a homeless man and you've got millions in the bank like it, there's nothing wrong with it and um you know a lot of the imams they used to have wear really nice clothing right they used to wear nice stuff because it looks it looks good and uh even imam malik he he would change clothes because he's like it's the knowledge that deserves this respect and so when i'm speaking about when i'm giving a, a fatwa if i'm talking about a certain topic then i, I wear these nice clothes i adorn myself in, out of respect for the knowledge that, that's being talked about even salah you know like you really want khushu in your salah well think about you know that's the time that i'm actually meeting my lord like think about it. if you ever met and an, even someone to the level of a mayor if you met the president if you met the prime minister if you met the sultan if you met the emir how would you go and meet that ta that person i mean you would dress up to make sure that you look good and that uh, people wouldn't say anything about you so what about when you're going to pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Yes, your aura should be covered. But at the same time, imagine the person that's like, oh, I have, I pick a special uh, dish dasha. I make sure that I, I wear, you know, nice cologne um, or itar. And I, I wear it. And then because I'm going to now pray to my Lord. You know, uh, imagine that compared to Oh, uh, I got my pajamas on, so I'm just going to go pray now. It just um, beautiful things don't necessarily mean expensive things. And I think that's where a lot of people get confused, right? So my dish dasha can just be a nice cotton, cleanly pressed, clean dish dasha. It's, it's fine. It doesn't have to be cashmere, and it doesn't have to have intricate embroideries and all of these extra things that don't really add much so looking nice and looking presentable um, is not the same as being extravagant of course we don't want to like use gold thread and silks and things like that um, but looking nice is actually part of and we, we actually get into this later about hygiene and, and appearances it is important the way that you look is important and for someone to completely neglect themselves and their appearance because they're like oh I'm so busy worshiping Allah that I can't you know comb my hair well no you can like and you should that's part of the worship is that you look presentable you first of all if you're married no woman wants to come home to that <laughs> okay so you need to look presentable if you're going out in public you need to look presentable you, you we should be literally the cleanest people on earth yeah, exactly. I think it comes down to quality. You know, people get things that are, you know, of value of good quality, not necessarily of extravagance. I mean, sure, you get the nice material for your dishdasha or your thobe, but it doesn't have to be a Gucci thobe. Yeah. Do they make those? Probably. <laughs> Man, they probably do. okay, for the shimak, they definitely do. So, you know, the Khutra or the Shemach that you put on your head, I remember when they started making Gucci and Louis Vuitton ones. Wow. Yeah. Okay, so moving right along. Um, that said, if a man has a spacious home, a disagreement arise, arises between him and his wife. He can leave her and spend the night in another room. This gives them both some time to think, reflect, and cool the anxiety. Yeah, how could you, if you're angry at each other, and it's like, well, I'm not talking to you, so I'm, I'll face the wall, and <laughs> you face the other wall because we can't go anywhere. So putting some distance between people, and there's a, there's a saying for this in English, it's um, distance makes the heart grow fonder. So being away from someone actually 
re-energizes that, um, that love that you have for them. Um, and you can ask anyone who's ever spent a considerable amount of time away from their families. They will definitely attest to that. Like, yes, that is absolutely true. But even in small doses, right? Like when you're just sick, sick of your wife or your husband, go away. Go shopping, go do some stuff, let it cool down. And then when you come back, you'll be like, all right, yeah, I missed you. It was, you know, I'm cool now. Sometimes that's all it takes. Sometimes you're irritated and it's not really their fault. It's just that here we are in this stupid room that's so small and everything, everything you do now is irritating me. And because I'm irritated, uh, I begin to take it out on you. And kids, of course, bear the brunt of this because they're a lot more active. And so you're always yelling at them and they're not supposed to be doing this and you broke this, you knocked this over, you made this mess. It's not fair. So just space can solve a lot of these problems. So, I mean, this is exactly what we talked about, you know, where you have that dedicated space for you to go and clear your head. You know, men, start investing in your libraries. Yeah. And here's a tip for the women. Um, when your husband goes to another room because he's angry or upset, leave him alone. Okay. That's why he's going to another room. You following him all the way to the room, standing outside the door, even coming. You're not helping the problem at all. Okay. He wants the space. Give him the space and give him some time and he will come to you. But if you keep going after him, you're, you're just throwing gas on the fire, right? You're not helping the problem. The reason why he's going to isolate is because he wants to put some space between you so that he can calm down, so that he can cool down, so that his emotions, you know, equal out. He has some equilibrium in his emotions. So, yeah, stop doing that. That's really, yeah, it's counterproductive. And just at the same time, brothers, when you are irritated, when you are upset, hold your tongue. Mm. Don't say uh, something that you'll regret. Go off to that place, you know. And in the end, if your home is not big enough, is not spacious enough, call up a brother. Call up a brother. Go to his place. Go hang out with him. You know, find someone that you can trust and uh, you can speak to. And not expose what you're going through with your family but at least someone that can hear you out. Yeah, this is something we'll have to cover in, in the podcast about marriage because there's all these little intricate things. And, uh, and the, the thing is that they, there really should be something for newly married couples because this is kind of something you figure out over time because you make all those mistakes earlier in the marriage and then later you're like, yeah, if I would have just not done that, it would have been so much easier on me. <laughs> Oh, tell me, I can tell you a hundred things that I'm like, man, I just a hundred. <laughs> you must not okay. be married very long. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe I have a good marriage. Yeah. So yeah, definitely something for the next podcast. Um, furthermore, children need space to run, jump and play without the furniture and household appliances being in their way. A roomy home will allow them to play under the watchful eyes of their parents and in the safety of the house. Later in life, they will not mind spending time in the house when they are teenagers and more susceptible to the temptations that come with that age. Yeah, you know, and I like the Arab seating specifically because it's just cushions and pillows. And so, you know, I've got three boys and they like to tear everything up. So having just cushions on the floor gives them, it really opens up the room and allows them to just run around and if they fall off of the couch, I guess you would call it, they're falling like, what, three inches? So <laughs> it's not going to be so bad. And, you know, like not cluttering up things because once kids are not coordinated, right? When you start cluttering things and putting, like, I don't own anything valuable that's breakable, right? And I don't think I would ever do that until after they're all out of the house because there's really no point in doing that, right? Why put something in there that you know is most likely going to get broken? And it's because they're always playing around and, and they're not paying attention to their surroundings. So they knock things over, things get broken, all kinds of stuff. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more. I remember even when I was younger going to um, 
different relatives' homes and just wanting to be able to use your surroundings as a place to play. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that this is what you should do. What I am saying is that having expensive furniture around, things that are fragile, glass tables, um, and when you do break those things, you know, people get upset. If you have a space where things are not as fragile and, you know, they can use that room like basically like a wrestling ring, then, uh, you know, they'll go nuts. Yeah. Um, the last thing he mentions in here, um, well, not the last thing, but the last thing I'm going to mention from this specific thing is, um, you know, if you are married and you have a family, you, you need to have privacy, all right? And it's hard to do that if you're all kind of living in a really cramped space. So the more space you have, the more space you can put between you and your children, which gives privacy for, um, you know, you and your wife and um, the, the comfort of the family in general, you know, so the kids can have their area and then the wife can, she can be in her area. You can be in your area. Everyone can have their own kind of personal space. And then when need be, then you have some privacy that you can put between you and your children. Yeah. And at the same time, also have those rooms where, you know, everyone should be gathered together. Yeah, like a family room. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Uh, just don't put a TV and a PlayStation in there. I mean, whatever. Do what you got to do. But all right. So that's that's all we're going to talk about for that section. Let's move on to number eight, which is good hygiene. Ah, kind of a we've talked a lot about basically that in general, um, but there is a lot that he adds to this. So um, uh, here he goes on. He says uh, the messenger of a law was very attentive to oral hygiene at a time when many so-called civilized people in the world were not concerned even with bathing regularly. Abu Huraira reported that the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Were it not for the fact that I do not want to make things too hard for my nation, I would have commanded them to use the tooth stick at every time of prayer. So to brush your teeth before every prayer, five times a day. So brushing the teeth, yes. And it's true. Islam, so the thing is, is that Islam brought cleanliness to the West. Islam brought... Uh, the toothbrush, Islam brought like uh, soaps, you know, soaps, perfumes, colognes, wearing good clothing. Like this came from Muslims. And when people saw that Muslims were very clean and very hy hygienic, they took that and they ran with it. Yeah. Uh, he says, uh, consequently, the first thing he did when he entered his home was clean his teeth and then... He kissed his wife. So important lessons here. Number one, kiss your wife when you get home. Second of all, brush your teeth before you do it. Why do you have to have yuck mouth and then go in there and kiss your wife? She doesn't appreciate that. So, you know, it's just a good good practice all in all. Uh, Abu Huraira reported that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, said, Every Muslim should bathe once every seven days when he should wash his head and all of his body. Now, seven days does not mean I have to wait seven days, but it's like at a maximum. Once a week, you have to take a bath. And of course, we're talking about Meccans, you know, uh, the Arabs who are living in the desert where water is not easily available. So this is actually a hardship for them. They don't have access to running water. They don't have access to, um, a lot of times, just water in general. So especially not in volumes that it would take to bathe. So um, this is like the promotion, the beginning of, hey, you know, you don't have a choice in the matter. You can't just be like, well, we don't have water. No, every seven days, take a bath, okay? Um, and now we kind of take it for granted. We take a shower every day. Well, at least I would hope so. Um, Sometimes more than once, you know, you go to the gym, you come home, you take another shower. So we, we there's really no excuse for us not to, to be bathing regularly. Um, and, you know, I read before uh, in another book a long time ago about um, water is like the best perfume. All right. It's like 
if you want to smell good, stop worrying so much about all the perfumes and the different stuff. First, like wash yourself. That's the number one best perfume you could ever do is apply water. Once you've applied the water and you've washed everything off, then you can worry about, you know, what scent you want to go after that. But like, don't take showers with perfume, right? That's not the purpose of it. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Some of this is cultural too, uh, because there are certain cultures like, so for instance, deodorant, um, I grew up with deodorant you know once you become like a teenager then it's like hey here take this put it under your arms or spray it or whatever uh there are certain cultures i guess where maybe it's not readily available or it's just not kind of a social norm to use it but uh, yeah somebody needs to have a talk along heart to heart with some of the people who you know they, they enter the massage and you know, nobody wants to stand next to them because the smell is so offensive and so horrible um, that it's distracting. So um, not just that, you you also will find, um, you know, I've, I've had brothers in the U.S., you know, they come in and it's like they smoke 10 cigarettes on the way to the masjid in a closed car because the cigarette smoke smell is so, so strong on them. And then, of course, they spray perfume on themselves so now they smell like cigarettes and perfume. Like it doesn't hide it at all. So all these offensive smells, and we know, according to the narrations, that the prophet said, "Don't eat onions and garlic before you go to the masjid because your breath is offensive to everyone." So if that's offensive, then what about other smells that are maybe even worse than that? Yeah, absolutely, man. You gotta smell good when you go to the masjid. You know, nobody, nobody wants to pray besides someone that doesn't smell good or someone that has bad hygiene. All right, moving on. Um, yeah, so if a man does not look clean and smell clean, it will be difficult for him to find a job. We know plenty of men who do not take the time to brush their teeth or iron the wrinkles out of their clothes. Some of these men loiter around the mosque angry and bitter because no one will give them financial help and they cannot find a suitable job. We advise them to tidy up, giving them grooming tips straight from the Sunnah. Some of these men took our advice. Now they have decent jobs and are gaining more respect every day. The others who refuse to change are still viewed with contempt by those who know them. Yeah, so, um, yeah. Who would have thought that ironing your shirt would be an important thing for getting a job? Appearances are everything. Uh, especially the first appearance. I, I know specifically of a guy in the, in the States who didn't have a job. He was getting uh, sadaqah from the masjid, had two wives, many, many children. And one of the brothers worked at a particular institution and there was a job opening. So he told him, hey man, can you do this kind of work? Yeah, cool. I'll schedule you an appointment. You can come in for an interview. All right. So he's at work doing his thing. And then they come to him and say, hey, did you send this guy for this thing? Yeah. But like he's he's out in the lobby. Go to look. Dude's got a turban and a thobe, white thobe. And it's like it's a construction job. And they're immediately they're like, no, we're, we're not going to hire. I'm, impossible. Like, why would you show up to a job interview in California? wearing a thobe and a turban, you know, and you know, some people think it's like, well, this is the Sunnah. We're going to wear, just wear this all the time. We have to wear this to follow the Sunnah. It's like, first of all, you need a job and you're not going to wear this. Nobody's going to let you wear this at work. It's not going to happen. They're not going to put you behind a desk. They're not going to put you, you know, in scaffolding, hanging, tiling or anything doing this in a thobe. So it's just one of the things it's like, the, the the way you present yourself, the way you um, professionalism, right? Having a, an I, I can't leave the house with a shirt that's wrinkled. I can't. It, it's impossible for me. I'm like, no, let's iron this shirt before we leave. So grooming standards, you know, having your beard neatly trimmed and, you know, you don't look like you just came out of the wilderness living with bears. 
uh, haircuts and smelling good and having cleanly pressed, nice, clean clothes. It's all just, it's just vital, vital. Yeah, absolutely. They have a saying. Um, they said the thing with first impressions is you only get one. And exactly, appearances are everything. Of course, we know the sayings, don't judge a book by its cover. But at the same time, you know, you only have a few seconds to show people that, you know, you're an interesting person or that you need to consider me for a job. And someone who's taking sadaqah and has, you know, many children and, I mean, that looks like someone who doesn't want the job because everybody knows that you got to present yourself in the best possible way. Yeah, for sure. Like, I mean, you wouldn't show up to a job interview in shorts and flip-flops, right? There's a certain standard that's expected if you're going to enter into a job. Like, you're trying to impress them. You you want to convince them that you're you're able to do something. So that's just, I don't know. Uh, it's a bit naive, I think. And, of course, this is a convert. So... Um, this is goes with the misconception of identity, which we'll have to have an entire separate conversation about. But like, how do I show that I'm a Muslim? All right, I have to wear a dishdasha everywhere I go. I have to wear a thobe and a turban. And it's like, no, you don't, man. You can just dress normal. You can be a Muslim with a tie. There's, there's no difference. So these are issues, issues that, of course, the Muslims, especially in the West, face. This is the same thing with marriage. You know, when you go to uh, ask for someone's daughter's hand in marriage, and think about how they're going to perceive you. They're going to judge you in the first few seconds that you walk into the room. Yeah, and if you can't even look presentable for me, then there's no way I'm going to give you my daughter. Like, it's impossible. I'm like, you showed up, you want to ask for my daughter looking like that? I'm like, no. Because it's it's indicative of a much bigger problem, right? Someone who doesn't um, doesn't take the time or the effort to make themselves look presentable is really kind of a reflection of a, a characteristic in their traits. Like it's a laziness and it's it's not respectable. You know, I, I, I wouldn't have much respect. Now, that doesn't mean that people who are not respectable can't look good in a suit and they're only putting on a show, but that will only last for so long, right? Showing up dressed presentable looking nice it only helps your case it's not a, it's not going to hurt you so not doing it there's really no excuse at all you know if you really want to know what type of person someone is check out the shoes check out how clean they are check out how they're taken care of you can tell a lot about a man from looking at his shoes all right so we're going to move on number nine number nine is excellent manners and we're only going to touch on this briefly because this again is an entirely different topic. It'll be a whole new podcast about manners and how we should interact with others. Um, having good manners is just, it means everything, honestly. Uh, having good manners is more valuable than being wealthy. Like, you can find people who are extremely poor but they have the best of manners. And it's like, I love those people more than I would ever love someone who lives in this great big mansion with all these expensive cars and has bad manners. Like, I respect manners um, more than anything. More than anything. So, being just, having uh, the highest level of manners, is it doesn't cost you anything, right? From the poorest person to the richest person, having good manners isn't going to cost you a dime. So there's really no excuse not to have it. Some things money can't buy, you know, and manners, akhlaq, adab, these are things that we really need to work on as Muslims. We have to, and that's the thing, someone's character can make them beautiful and someone's character can make them ugly. So definitely, we we have to be working on our manners. We have to be working on our adab and our akhlaq. Yeah. Um, and, and the manners, it really, it's not, um, it doesn't just pertain to a certain group of people. Like, I don't just have good manners with my friends. And I don't just have good manners with my family. Like Good manners with everyone, right? Muslim, non-Muslim, 
friends, people I don't know. Um, good manners is just just good manners, and it's something. This is something that has to be taught at home. This is not something that kids are just going to pick up off the streets. So you have to teach them at home, and you have to demand it from home. Uh, my kids, uh, they know when we enter into a place, I go say, go give salam to him, right? And they're a little bit shy, but it's like no, this is this is part of your manners. You see an older person, you need to go greet them. They don't need to come to greet you. You're the young one. Um, my my sons with their grandmother. Uh, one of my sons, I heard him say, um, he told her, you know, bring me some water, right? He's they were like eating and stuff, and he's like, you know, Jedati, my grandmother, bring bring me some water. I'm like, bro, no, no, no. You get up, you go, and you bring her water. And then when she's finished drinking, then you can drink all the water you want. But that's something that has to be taught. That's not something they're intuitively going to pick up. And that's another reason why men have to go home. You know, uh, you are the role model. You are the example. And your children are a reflection of you. Yeah. Oh, definitely. See, this is a difficult concept though that kids are a reflection of you because in many many ways yes they are but they you can't control everything because i know some guys who are the nicest kindest people and then their kids turn out to be just turds <laughs> you can't i mean like and you're like how did you how did this happen but at the end of the day kids do have their own individual personalities but you do have an influence and the, and the thing i think where this comes in is you have to start very, very early, right? You can't wait until they're like teenagers and then be like, okay, now I'm going to teach you how things work. Like, no, from day one, you have to insist upon this so that they grow up with this understanding. You can't just start trying to apply it later in life. Yeah, exactly. All right, number 10. Uh, we're going to, I think we'll actually be able to finish this today. Number 10 is dependable transportation. Oh, I love this topic. It says benefits of dependable means of transportation. In some societies, one of the signs that a boy has reached manhood is his obtaining his own vehicle. By the same token, one of the signs that a man still has some remnants of boyhood in his depend is his dependence on others to pick him up from and drop him off at different places. Of course, he may be undergoing a hardship like financial loss or health issues, which may prevent him from obtaining a vehicle or a driver's license. If, if this is not the case, and he is calling others for a ride, even though he has the physical, mental, and financial ability to drive himself, this indicates negligence and immaturity. Amazing. Great. Because um, you do still see this. I cannot ask someone for a ride. I, 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 I'll just take a taxi. I... I, I I don't feel comfortable. Uh, I don't feel comfortable not having a car. Um, and I grew up, we, we didn't have a lot of money, so we had some really crappy cars. And on more than one occasion, I've been stranded on the side of the road. And so now that I'm in a financial position that I can afford a nice car, that's one of the first purchases I made was a new car because I don't want my wife and children sitting on the side of the road while we're then waiting for someone to come rescue us. So having dependable transportation, that's the, the key. I mean, having a car that, you know, it's like working one day, not working the next is not very beneficial. And it adds so much stress because even in my early like 20s, you know, I had some pretty crappy cars too because I couldn't afford anything better. And you're always worried if I'm going to get to where I'm going. And then when I come out, is my car going to start? Is transmission going to shift? You know, it's like I, I'm afraid that something's going to break because I know I can't afford to fix it. And it's just one more undue stress. So having a car that's dependable, it doesn't have to be brand new, but it's sturdy. It, it runs fine. It's I mean, this is really high on the list, especially in today's culture where you need a car. You really do. I mean, we're, we're not living in a time where you're just staying in one general area. You're traveling distances in most places. So it's absolutely vital. We're not talking about people 
that have financial stress. We're not talking about people that can't afford a car. We're not talking about people that have a disability and they can't drive a car. We're talking about providing transportation for your family, something dependable. It is definitely important. We need to make sure that uh, you have a way of getting your family from A to B. And uh, it doesn't have to be the fanciest car. It doesn't have to be the nicest car. But it should be, like you said, a dependable car or a dependable vehicle. Nowadays, uh, that also means, you know, uh, with with the advent of Uber, with the advent of uh, uh, Lyft, you've got uh, public transportation. Uh, but Uber is just it's really easy. You know, uh, you can you can use your app to call someone, to pick you up, drop you. You don't even have to talk to them, and it's actually fairly cheap. Uh, you talked about not asking for rides from from people, uh, taxis and Uber. Like, it, yeah, it's it's a possibility, but at the same time, it's also it can be more expensive than if you just went and purchased a car. But those things are are still dependable transportation. I mean, they're dependable. You can Uber. You can get a car here. It's the not having dependable transportation. Like I have to go and call someone and say, "Hey, can you come and take me and my family grocery shopping?" Um, and of course, you know th there are circumstances, and I don't mind helping people when they need a ride, but it is a burden on the person that you're asking because you're taking their time. And one of the concepts that I think a lot of these people don't understand is when they can't afford a car and then you say, well, why don't you just buy a car? Well, I'm trying to save money. Okay, but you're not saving money. The only thing is you're, you're spending my money instead of spending your money because this car doesn't run off of oxygen. I still have to put fuel in it. So, so me picking you up and taking you places didn't save money. It may have saved money for you personally because you didn't pay anything, but it cost me. So you're just putting the cost on the person who's taking you around. They, they're not operating for free, okay? And if you don't own a car, you probably don't look at it like this. But when you own a car and you have to go to the gas station and put money in all the time and you have to pay the insurance and you have to get oil change and you have to do all that, it takes a lot of money. So you see the financial relationship between having a, a vehicle and operating a vehicle is not cheap. It's not just like I bought a car now I don't have to spend any money ever again. It, it's a it's a pretty large expense. For sure, and it has to do with priorities. You know, uh, as a man, you have to provide a home. You have to provide uh, transportation. You have to provide uh, safety, security. And I mean, there are cities like if you lived in New York, London, you know, major cities that have trains and subways they're dependable because they run on schedule right that it's not a problem and it's really if you're living in new york city it's not practical to own a car you could walk to the place faster than because the traffic is just so horrific not to mention the cost of insurance petrol is even more expensive there parking is ridiculous so there are certain circumstances where it's it's just not worth it but because there is an alternative because taxis are very easy to get because there's a train and there's a subway and you have those are considered dependable forms of transportation so he goes on um he says uh, that said we do not advocate that you spend your entire savings to purchase a luxury vehicle just to show off but keep in mind that the messenger of law, peace be upon him, himself rode a red camel, the best and the most highly regarded among riding beasts. He was the most pious and ascetic among people, and yet he chose to ride a strong and sturdy beast. Likewise, strong and sturdy and not opulent and luxurious should be your choice. So yeah, the red camel was like the Rolls Royce of camels. Um... And the thing is, the reason why he chose the camel is not because it was a red camel, but because that thing was strong and it wasn't going to abandon him and die in the desert. Like that's how you you chose camels, right? That's how you knew which camels were the best. So there would be people be like, well, don't take this camel. This is a weak camel. Take this one. This one is a strong one. So it was all based on functionality. It's not like, 
like you have the camel beauty contest now in some places where they're like, oh, look at the eyelashes and look at the lips and we're putting Botox in camel lips. Like it's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. All for beautification. And, and some of these camels are like hundreds of thousands of dollars. For what? Right? We don't even ride camels anymore. But that's not the point of it, right? The point is not that he he rode a red camel because it was a luxury. It was because it was a strong, it was the like the sturdiest camel. It wasn't going to be undependable. And I'd also like to know how long he had it for. Because, you know, we know Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, was always, was the most generous. So we know uh, when he acquired wealth, just as easy as he would he would get it. It was just as easy that he would give it away. That's the that's the definition of was it zuhud, like uh, asceticism. It's not that you don't have nice things. It's that your heart's not attached to that nice thing. So, like some of the Sahaba, like uh, Uthman ibn Affan, take his wealth, take it all away, and it, he's cool. He's like it's it's not. It doesn't break my heart that this is gone. So having it or not having it really makes no difference whatsoever. And that's the same thing as you're saying. Like having this nice shirt, okay, you want it? I can give you because I have no attachment to it whatsoever. None. Yeah, it's a really nice shirt. Go ask somebody who's wearing a really expensive shirt. Like, hey, bro, that's a nice shirt. He'll be like, yeah, man, I spent like $300 on it. You know, it's from this brand, whatever. You know, he's not going to give it to you because he's spent an incredible amount of money and he's really attached to it because it has this huge value for him and uh, also Hamza I don't think he's your size yeah that's true probably not it's really hard to find my size um, outside of the US turns out most people aren't that big uh, three X's are is not a normal size you know outside of America I guess but anyway you know do we do what we do so we're, we actually reached the last um, number 11 of the essentials um, this also is not going to take much time. Uh, basic understanding of issues of fiqh. Uh, when we talk about fiqh, we're talking about different rulings when it comes to Islam, like what is permissible, what is not permissible. Um, there's a lot in here, but uh, I'll just read two very short paragraphs, and that's that we're going to close out with this. He says, um, knowledge is power. As you begin to grasp the very fundamental principles of jurisprudence, your intellect is bound to expand. How many times have we learned something new about the world or about ourselves and then cringed at the thought of our former intellectual position or behavior concerning that issue? All the time, man. And that's part of growth. Like, I think back to some of the things I vehemently, like, argued for, and now I'm like, yeah, that was wrong. That was wrong. And that's part of trying to understand and always uh, discussing and learning new things. One of the benefits of knowing the basics of fiqh is that you will keep silent most of the time. Many believe that the more knowledge one gains, the more vocal he becomes. In reality, the opposite is true. Take a look at the loudest, most opinionated person in the mosque and ask yourself, is he the most knowledgeable person there? He is most likely to be one of the ignorance. And that's true. Yeah, I mean... Understanding and having knowledge really makes you shut up. <laughs> you know, it's like I. You you look at things differently because, you may have an understanding, but the person you're that's trying to debate you is not trying to gain understanding. He's trying to prove a point, and so it's there's no point in arguing. You just, you know, zip it and go about your day. You know that's a very good point. The man is the emir of the household. So if the Amir doesn't have a basic understanding, the one that is supposed to, you know, is responsible for the whole household, and he doesn't have the knowledge, how can he guide his family towards the right path? Uh, everybody wants to be a leader of something. Everybody wants to be uh, a manager. Everybody wants to be, uh, you know, in, in politics. Everybody wants to have, like, a, a, a title. But they all don't realize that, you know, being a father, a husband, you know, uh, an emir, a leader of the household, 
they don't understand that that is a big responsibility and title itself. So there is responsibility to know your deen. You have to know the basics in order to at least guide the ones that are around you. Of course, how are your kids going to know anything unless you teach them that? Uh, it's it's baffling to me in the West where you'll have just um, you have Muslim immigrants, and then in just one generation. Um, the kids have lost almost all connections. Uh, I do know individuals who their parents immigrated from an Arab country and they can't speak Arabic. They don't know Arabic. And you'll bring up very simple Islamic jurisprudence. You're like, well, this is allowed or this is not allowed. And they have no clue. And it's, it's amazing to me that you could raise a family like that Tell them they're Muslims, say that we're Muslims, and they have no understanding of Islam. And I've known kids who, uh, when they come to pray, they only know one prayer, the Eid prayer, because that's the only time they've ever prayed. And it's they, they have no understanding of how actual Salat works because their parents never told them, and they live in the West. So the school's not going to tell them. Their friends aren't going to tell them. Uh, and I, I always wonder, you know, when you die, your children can make dua for you. If you don't teach them to make dua for me when I die, then they're not going to do it. Like, why would you not even invest in your own future? Like, I want my kids to understand completely how it works so that when I do die and I need their dua, they know how to do it. But how it's not intuitive. It's not like they just wake up and say, you know, we should really make dua for our father who died 10 years ago. No, you have to like instill this into them. So, you know, it, it's like you get what you put into it. And if you don't dedicate the time and the effort to, to educating and knowing what the rulings are, I mean, you have kids doing things where you're like, you know, you're not allowed to do this, right? But their parents don't know that you can't do that because they were never taught. And so it keeps going and it's like, how can you distinguish right and wrong if you don't know the evidence and the, the rulings on what's right and wrong, right? Then it just becomes, culture starts really imposing itself and different ideas start seeping in and then everything becomes okay. Yeah, and I think it also comes down to questioning, right? Um, I think uh, people, especially coming from immigrant backgrounds, um, our parents and our grandparents are just told to follow something and just do it. So traditionally, our parents and our grandparents uh, were doing things just because they were told to do things. But what, what you see is when you come to the West, you know, you're surrounded by so many different ideologies and so many different uh, people and different cultures that, you know, you start asking, you know, why? And when parents don't have the answer because they didn't, research it themselves, um, they're not going to be able to convince you of why. Yeah, and, and kids won't accept that. No, absolutely. That doesn't work. Yeah, absolutely. And kids, um, you know, there's not, see, that's the thing. There's nothing wrong with wondering and finding out, you know, uh, why do we do something? There is something wrong with questioning in a sense that, you know, when you question Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a, in a disrespectful way like for example uh you know some people they're always saying like why why do we have to do this why do we have to pray why do we have to put our hands on our chest uh, why do we have to put our you know when we say uh when we say the shahada why do we have to put our index finger up like the, asking ridiculous questions like that but there's nothing wrong with wondering like hmm you know allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created stars and planets uh, I wonder what those stars are made out of you know I wonder what uh, you know uh, we, we have plants I wonder what causes plants to grow you know there's nothing wrong with wondering and also with the religion you know oh you know why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to uh, pray five times a day why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tell us to and and when I say that I'm talking about you're thinking about the wisdom behind it and I'm not saying you will have the right answer, but we talked about this uh, the other day that salah causes discipline. 
So there's nothing wrong with wondering and trying to find out the wisdom behind things. It doesn't mean you're always going to find the answer because it's powerful to say those you know, three words, I don't know. And it's just something that people can't say. Yeah. Um, this is a topic that we're going to have to pick up with uh, parenting. Um, but, yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, in conclusion, right, that was the first, uh, first 11. So we still got 33 suggestions to go through. It's going to take us, I think, a, a while to get through all of this. Um, but... Yeah, just a basic understanding of fic. I mean, you need to know your religion, um, or else you can't teach anybody else that. So, uh, thank you for again coming in, and I look forward to the next time we're able to get together so that we can uh, complete this book. And let's see if we can do it in four podcasts. Might have to make it five. We'll see, inshallah. Barakallah fiq. All right, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.